today we are with Jack Butcher. I've known Jack for a number of years now, and Jack has recently been getting quite heavily into crypto, um, and you know, he's been documenting his journey quite well online. And you know, he's had quite a few very interesting kind of crypto projects, and that's what we will be trying to discuss in this podcast. And I'm also here joined with Pat. And I think the best way to kind of, you know, um, start these kind of podcasts is just into the deep end. And, you know, if you can kind of go into your background and then how you kind of got involved with, you know, your current projects. Um, and I suppose we can take things from there. Sounds good. Yeah. So my background is in graphic design. So I've studied graphic design at university in Cardiff in uh, 2007, graduated in 2010. And shortly after graduating, I moved to New York to um, get some design, real world design experience. And uh, fortunately, one person of the 150 emails I sent replied to me and gave me a shot at a design internship in New York and worked in that agency world for all together. So I started a little boutique agency, uh, which branding projects for little um, restaurants and like independent businesses all the way to working for big digital consultancies that work with American Express, Ferrari, like massive international fortune 500 brands building all sorts of things. Um, product, digital products, websites, um, anything that appears on a screen. So I had a lot of exposure to the world of design. And then after about eight years of experience, I was like, Oh, how hard can it be? I'll start my own agency and that was a you know sort of baptism of fire there was plenty of things i didn't think through before making the leap and um you know was competing with the businesses that i used to work for and obviously did not have the resources that they had and the expectation in that world you know as a consultant for these big brands is more about just absorbing their inefficiencies and having two hour long conference calls and things of that nature. So the, the life I envisioned having operating my own business was very different to the reality. And then I just slowly changed the business model. So I, I started with an agency called opponent that was in 2017. We got a few decent sized corporate clients and just got burned out after about six months, nine months, and then just started to really focus in on, uh, what we could do that was unique. So we went from shooting commercials, uh, designing websites, writing email sequences, basically any creative exercise under the sun to this very specific set of deliverables, which got the name visualized value because it was really the process of taking intangible ideas and turning them into something that people could see. So client mix changed from there. We weren't working with big fortune 500 businesses for a little while. We started working with little startups, software companies, hedge funds. And from there, again, hit the same barrier, just in a different way. So had a very specific niche and was serving a very specific uh, need. But eventually, you know, you scale to the point where you can't serve everybody that wants to work with you. So then turned that into uh, an, a product business. So we had a couple of education products, one on design, one on uh, productizing knowledge. And that has been maybe the la the focus for the last 18 months or so. And then in the last six months, really just discovered the world of, I've been invested in crypto for years, but in terms of application, I'd kind of uh, not really exposed myself to practitioners in the world of crypto, just buying on Coinbase and letting it sit there. Uh, but in the last six months, through all of the students that came through Visualize Value, I've been introduced to people who are active in the crypto world and nfts were a part of a few conversations i had early early 2021 and um the first couple of times i was pointed in the direction of nfts i was like what is this i don't really understand it i've got something that works i'm gonna just crack on and keep doing that and you know after the sixth seventh time they were mentioned to me i was like okay i need to take a serious look at this and that's when i started just playing around in that world so the most basic execution of 
NFTs possible to begin with, which is essentially taking art and selling it. And then uh, have slowly been exploring that split space since uh, got into a little bit of the collect the collection side of things and trying to expand upon the like the technical execution of nfts through visualized value so getting away from just um auctioning individual pieces of art and into things that you know can only be executed as nfts that's a, a kind of great point you're you're almost walking me into my next uh my question here but um what what have you kind of done so far that's different in terms of like uh creating an nft that does more than like you say just create something that like looks nice or feels good yeah so there's been a couple different projects i um i started on foundation if you're familiar with that platform it's like the prettiest in my opinion one of one platform so you you know you upload a piece of art and a 24-hour auction kicks off essentially and the highest bidder wins and that obviously limits Uh, by design that limits the kind of things that people do on there so my first couple experiments on there were um, strictly art pieces and then since then I've done a few things like um, post reveal so I did these um, what I call them booster packs so in the same way that you know you buy a pack of Pokemon cards or a um, uh, football cards had people basically bid blindly on these auctions and had eight of them running at a time. So you start to get into game theory and all these different market mechanics that happen uh, where people are comparing the price of something that isn't actually, they don't know what they're bidding on, but they know that they're competing for one of eight things. So that was the first execution of it. And since then I've been, I auctioned my time. So NFTs as kind of, uh, you know, uh, an abstraction of a service so three hours of my time is auctioned for x and then you kind of get to set the market rate for your time and you have something to point to as you know if anyone comes to you and wants to uh get on the phone or need you to help out with something it's a really interesting way of finding like price discovery for talent so that's another experiment i ran i did a few charity executions so um when there was uh, displacement of families in Afghanistan recently. There's a there's a company called the Giving Block, which works with charities to essentially generate crypto addresses for them to receive donations. And there's another platform I've been playing around with called Mirror, which is um, I w- maybe this is an offensive way to describe it to them, but it's like the WordPress of crypto. It's like a decentralized blogging platform and it has all these NFT features baked in. So what you're able to do there is create an NFT with a set number of additions and with a fixed price, and then you can direct the funds to whichever address you like. So I don't know. I don't have to custody funds. I don't have to even have conversations with that charity. You can raise money for something and direct funds. Uh, in such a new and interesting way. And then on the donation side, the person that's giving, uh, the person that's like pledging capital to this cause is getting something in return. So that's another like deep rabbit hole, I think, around philanthropy and giving and like the status that you can associate with giving. You know, like um, people on Facebook do those photo filters where it's like, I support this cause. I've put a filter over my photo. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we can now say, okay, do you have, like, how much did you spend? Like, how much skin in the game do you have? How much did you, you know, how much of your capital did you pledge towards this issue? And we can measure how much you really care about it. So I think yeah, we'll probably get into that in this conversation, but NFTs aren't just about uh, the art you want to collect, or at least right now, obviously they're going to expand beyond that, but they could also be about the things you believe in, the causes you support, um, essentially w- signaling your skin in the get in various different games. Some of them are like fun status games, stuff that you do for, you know, just to hang around with your mates and other stuff is 
uh, more indicative of like what you believe in. And, you know, maybe there's not as much personal upside for you from a financial perspective or a social, well, there is social upside, but a different kind of social upside. Yeah, I mean, you know, one, one of your project, biggest projects, uh, as far as I know, is, you know, the, definitely the, 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 um, the charity project. And um, like what I'm kind of seeing a lot recently is with like there, there's a whole um, era of like shit coins, but they were charity shit coins in the sense that, you know, they would pledge like 10 percent of every um, of the entire treasury, like every month to right, charities. Right. right? And this would pump the price. And now what we're seeing is the same thing happening with like these 10,000 NFT collections yeah, of yeah. like random animals. Um, like, so what are your kind of thoughts on the future of charity uh, in, in a sense? And, you know, how, like, because, we, we, you know, essentially what crypto does, it allows you to directly, you know, um, and very effectively, you know, give money to someone in a way that's not centralized. Um, you know it's, it's very peer to peer so like what do you kind of think is that the future and you know is there any kind of like avenue where you will be setting up a sort of like you know a, a dao charity or a charity dao or something where you know you're constantly doing this or something you know is, what are your kind of like next steps in that avenue yeah so i think there's a bunch of different ways this can play out i think the amazing or the breakthrough part of technology is the is the like what it does on the social and the network effect side of things so anybody can set up a go well that's not actually true right gofundme i think is it probably has restrictions based on uh countries and where funds can go and things of that nature so the first piece of it is it's like introduces a more frictionless way to raise money which i think just expands the scope of applications and then the second is this like token i guess excuse the pun there of of your participation so you're um able to especially if you have a network or a following like if you're a you know a celebrity in whatever circle if you have a a group of people that follow what you say i think this provides a a really and and a lot of people won't do it for this reason but it provides a really transparent way to direct um attention and subsequently capital in in towards these causes you believe in in the same way you get these like dumb videos of people like you know reading a line into a camera on black and white versus like okay this is ashton kutcher or whoever this is his ethereum wallet and he's spent a thousand ethereum this year and it's gone in all of these different directions so as a global theme i think crypto is it's really weird um it's kind of a a strange um like idiosyncrasy with crypto it's like about privacy and like the ability to transact um without friction but it's also super public if you if you start doing business under a or if you start behaving under a wallet that is attached to your name then all of your activity is trackable so it's kind of this it's this strange um almost contradictory quality about it and i think that that to me is the the mechanic that underlies everything that's going to change behavior it's it's Obviously, the interfaces and the technology will all change with time. And there's so much talent working in that space that I feel like, you know, it's going to happen quickly. But the underlying difference, I think, is it you can kind of call out bullshit with crypto in the same way that you can, you know, read the list of transactions and know who's, you know, who's made a good trade, who's made a bad trade. Um, there are really interesting social implications of being able to display what you support or how much money you've raised for x it's like um instead of quarterly um reports there's you know it's like a real-time market and i think that also happened on the charity side that's something that's super interesting too is if you're accepting crypto as donations is um 
does that start to force charities to be more transparent in how they spend funds? And does it make charities more efficient? Because we all know, for the most part, nonprofits are not the most like effective deployers of capital in the world. So does crypto help with that? I um, record a podcast with a guy called Bilal Zaidi. And he, uh, he worked at Charity Water for a while. And they, I think, did a ton of work to get incredibly transparent about where money was going. So if you spend X, you'll get insight as to which, um, you know, how much you contributed to building this well, where, what the coordinates of it are, how much money was spent on supplies, how many people it's um, providing clean water to, et cetera, et cetera. So I think I'm, I think the, um, the transparency of crypto hopefully flows into the behavior of the, uh, the deployment of capital on the other side of that issue. And I think that's bigger than just people donating to charity. It's, it's crypto native companies in general just have to be way more uh, transparent about where their money is going. There's sort of two, two interesting things I'd like to touch on there. One, the, um, uh, the like public nature of everything. Um, if you were to, you know, announce on your social media, hey, you know, I just, uh, I just donated a hundred thousand dollars to this charity, and you did that. Let's say you're you're a billionaire, and you do that every time you you make a donation. There's sort of uh, something a little garish about that, or a little um, kind of on the nose. But if you're just doing that publicly and everyone can just see it, it's a little, uh, it's a little more socially acceptable. So like, do you think there's there's an advantage there to just having all that charitable given just kind of out in the open in terms of ha having people it be more almost socially acceptable to show that you're donating? Yeah, you know, it's funny, but I think there's something interesting about this that you can draw a parallel outside of the charity stuff. So like the profile picture craze, the NFT craze you use the word garish and imagine somebody was like posting screenshots of their bank account or their like ether scan wallet based on the valuation of their nfts you'd be like what a prat but for some reason there's this abstract layer of the you know the nft or the image or the you know the community component that's tied to that that makes it far more i mean you guys respond to this as well but my perception of it is it's far more socially acceptable to change your profile picture to a $150,000 monkey than to post a tweet of your, you know, a $150,000 deposit in your account. So it's just this weird layer of abstraction that has changed what is, it's, it's sort of shifting the conversation or what's acceptable in uh, talking about money and finance, which I think you could, there's, there's definitely two sides to that argument, but it's, um, it's, uh, in, in, in terms of raising money for charity, will it make more people like, uh, feel less garish in sharing their contributions? I think, yes. Yeah, I, I think that's a very kind of interesting point. And um, I, I've seen a lot of interesting things in regards to, um, you know, increasing the the um, the domain of like public goods. So for instance, open source, and then rewarding people that contribute to that, you know, wherever code gets used in open source, um, you know, increases in like, you know, it, it, it generates, you know, a percentage of the revenue, or it goes to a certain wallet. Um, so there's one, one thing like that. The other thing um, I, I kind of noticed that you were participating in was um, a thing called a party bid. Um, you know, I'm, I'm quite interested in hearing mm -hmm. you know, how that kind of came about, what that is. And then, you know, just trying to go a bit more into detail for the viewers. Yeah, so this was a... So party bid is a tool that I believe was built by party DAO. So a group of people that self-organized, raised some money, and ultimately paid some developers within the community that they built to develop this tool called PartyBid, which is essentially a crowd-funded, um, it's like a mechanism to bid on auctions as a crowd. So 
in the like heat of nft mania that there's these one one of one pieces going for 500 ethereum 600 ethereum thousands of ethereum in some cases crypto punks you know some of the like blue chip top tier nft art and party bid is a a tool for essentially getting everyone making it possible for like people with smaller bank rolls to get exposure to those assets by bidding as a group and um anyone can set one up without permission so say i put a piece up for auction on foundation this is actually what happens somebody can take that auction link and go and set up a party bid and organize a bunch of people to come and contribute capital to that party bid and then bid on that auction um and they use a tool called fractional art to custody the asset and split it and do figure out all of the like you know we vote to sell this as a group it's kind of hyper complex uh, mechanically on the back end but so early i think people are willing to experiment with this stuff um yeah there's also people that are fractionalizing collectible assets through just this uh, fractional art tool and letting you know essentially tokenizing a token tokens all the way down and you can buy um you know, a fractional share of a piece of art or a, i don't know a, a, a token that represents ownership in a DAO. I th i'm fairly sure and um anyone technical listen to this can probably correct me but i don't think that is um limited to uh nfts as we think about them now it's like the uh the ability to again like the charity conversations like give people exposure to new assets that require way less permission and there's obviously downside to that too as you're seeing in uh regulation world and i know you talked about DAOs, and one of the reasons i just have no intention of exploring setting that up by myself right now is because the there's obviously this crazy looming regulatory risk there and uh seeing how that plays out is interesting there is a few there are a few legal firms in the states particularly that are i mean genius pivot that are just helping people set up sturdy legal frameworks for building DAOs, but there are also people that are just spinning them up on discord and perhaps uh exposing themselves to some nasty uh i don't know litigation down the road we'll see yeah i i think um you know just from my own kind of experience in crypto now it's um regulation and lawyers is it's, it's a huge kind of headache um you know and i kind of welcome you know, people just like trying to clarify and, you know, set up best practices in a, in a most, you know, open kind of way. Um, but, but going back to, you know, the party bid and the, the nature of party bid and the fractionalization or, you know, tokenization all, all the way down, um, you know, what, what kind of effects, you know, do you think this will have in terms of, um, let's say, the creator economy or design or art in general? Because you do have quite a bit of experience. You know in those overlapping fields yeah i think um i think as a concept it's great but i also think the this is the i wasn't heavily into crypto in 2017 so the you know the ico mania of 2017 is constantly repeated back to me by people who have been in the space a long time and i think you know that's a function of how easy it is to make these things. So without doing a good amount of research or without getting lucky in some instances, like you could get horribly burned by buying into the wrong project or betting on the wrong network. But outside of that, I think I built education products over the last couple of years that were essentially helping people figure out how to build a network from scratch, which is incredibly difficult, right? If you have a skill set and you're, you're trying to build a company, you're trying to serve clients, or you're trying to build a product that serves clients, then until very recently, like you're completely on your own there. 
what I think some of these tokenized communities do where everybody has some share of upside is it's, it, it shifts, it, it shifts incentives in a, in quite a subtle way where you don't need to build your own network from scratch. You can buy into one of these networks and then use your skill to increase the value of that network. So if you're a video editor or animator or a watercolor painter, let's say, you trying to build your business from scratch on Twitter and get people to commission you is freaking difficult. If you like got into, you know, um, NFT project X early on, let's say board apes, right? You buy a board ape for 300 bucks in March and you're, um, or April, I can't, May, I don't know when, when it was, but you're then in that network. And the, the way that, uh, the way that network functions is everybody is trying to increase the exposure and value of this um, brand. So you can actually you apply your skill. You can either commission work of other people's art, or you can, you know, work on behalf of the, the collective. So, you know, promote the, the project as a whole with your skill. And I think, that's very different than going and applying for a job at a company where maybe you have a supervisor that keeps you within a certain set of boundaries or, you know, that's not, that's outside of your job title. You can really just plug into a network and experiment with how your skill can be an exponent to that network in some way. And I think that that part is very promising for um, the creator economy and in inverted commas. And I always kind of had an issue with that term because it's, it implies like, Hey, just make something and you're, you will, uh, you'll reap financial rewards. It's just not the case. Right. So, uh, these networks, I think really subtly shift incentives that people that do have skills can monetize them faster and more effectively. So I've actually seen this play out myself. Um, a little bit where um, a project that I am quite involved with, I kind of got in fairly early. I was I was lucky in a sense, but I've used it. It's the um, Forgotten Runes Wizard Cult, and I've oh, yeah, done I've a few of those. Yeah, right. They're 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 pretty cool, and I've I've done some animations for people, and they pay me an ETH, and then I go and buy other NFTs with that ETH, and yeah. you know, I couldn't have just if I just on a with my skill set, I wouldn't have, and my network, I would not have been able to just start selling, you know, animated gifts for hundreds of dollars. Right, right, right. <laughs> it just it would have been an impossible dream. But with a fairly small investment in terms of time in the community, and you know, um, a few hundred dollars for a couple NFTs, I was able to sort of shortcut that whole process. Um, yeah. Do you see any other ways, like? The, the problem I see now is that, you know, I couldn't buy a wizard now for a couple hundred dollars. It would now cost me like a couple months rent to buy a wizard and get started in that community. Um, okay. So here's a, yeah, go sorry. Ahead. I was just going to say, so the ownership piece I think is optional in the short term because of platforms like Twitter and discord, especially discord where you're, you can get directly into that community in most cases without ownership, right? Maybe there's mm -hmm. some gated, there are some gated elements to that discord channel but you can go in there and like hey i'm a huge fan of this project like aesthetically it speaks to me i believe in where you're taking it and here are some things that i produced that i think are you know in line with what you're trying to do or your community is going to appreciate you don't have to necessarily have skin in the game in that project you can have skin in the game in a different way right i've invested my time to produce this thing mm -hmm. that makes you guys look good. So one of the curriculums that we produced last year was called the permissionless apprentice. Yep. And, um, that had a lot to do with this approach, but it was, it's a higher risk strategy or I didn't say higher risk. It's like, um, a lower probability strategy because you're picking a person or one organization that, um, maybe, the people who are making decisions don't have skin in the game in the same way that an NFT community would. Gotcha. So, um, so if anything, it's, it's to... easier in this sense, applying maybe that same model to an NFT community, because it's sort of, uh, you don't, 
you don't need the like CEO or the the purchaser or whoever to agree with you, right? You just need somebody exactly. in that community too. Exactly. And the yeah, the this the kind of the position that somebody in that situation is already in or is already signaled by being a buyer of that thing is like they're primed for like contributing to the valuation of the thing. Um, this is one of the things in the agency world that is just so frustrating is you are dealing with people who have who basically are not judged on the outcome, right? So risk or like certain things are not appealing to them, even if they may have chance of payoff or upside. It's like, you know what? Nobody gets fired for hiring IBM. You've heard that one before. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the world of consulting is basically like, hey, I, I basically just need to justify the decision to my boss that I hired this per this agency and they need to justify that decision to their boss. And I'm getting my salary at the end of every two weeks, regardless of what happens here. So I think it's just a completely different mentality where growing the network uh, is is not necessarily priority number one in a lot of those environments versus NFT land. Um, we're seeing a lot more of that. And even projects that are coming out and experimenting with the idea of IP rights and what is, um, we're going to release this under the public domain because we know that the, the meme becomes more valuable the more it, um, the more it, uh, rates. And that's like an inverse model to, you know, old school corporate thinking, right? Even you're seeing that in some of the more successful companies now, Tesla open sourced their patents. So it's like, yeah, we're going to do this better than anyone else. But if you want to, if you want to copy any of our technology, here's the plans, go, go for it. Um, we're confident that we have enough of a lead or that our vision is um, specific enough that we're going to succeed anyway. So I think it's like, it sounds crazy to say it, but it just, it really had like, uh, especially for, you know, people in creative industries, which is kind of the, the low hanging fruit of all this stuff, right? Making art and entertainment and content on the internet, the barriers to start participating in this world and these communities are close to zero. You don't even need to pay to get in, but chances are, you know, as a, as a byproduct of your, uh, contribution, you then get skin in the game in these communities and more and more people want to support your work. So it, it, it makes a huge difference, I think. Oh yeah. And, uh, like I've even seen people be gifted NFTs for just being active members in a community. Right. Right. I, yeah, I think that's a really underrated, um, component of all this too, is, um, the, you know, I, I wrote this tweet a while back. It's pretty tongue in cheek, but the idea is vibes are the new fundamentals so it's like if you can gather a bunch of people together and they all um like you know you have these pivotal characters or these pillars in your community that really make it if you have a product that exists solely on the internet then the community or the communication between people is like the glue that keeps it going you want to reward people that create that feeling of community and it makes even you're seeing um, projects kind of bake in some of those rewards to people that support the projects early on. Like they'll do, in the case of the uh, the profile picture avatar communities, they'll do like one of one um, one of one gift additions for people that are part of the NFT community already or have pledged support to support them in some way or another. So, yeah, just. Um, it's all, a, I think, a byproduct of this like la lack of friction and transparency um, where you have, uh, what's the Taleb quote? Don't tell me what you think. Show me what's in your portfolio. It really upends the people who make a living by just saying what they think. Just sort of circling back to the... Um... On, like on the other side of that, we, you, you talked a few minutes about about Mirror uh, Foundation. A number of these organizations sort of represent almost the opposite of that, in that they're still kind of the walled garden, 
you know, you either need to have your mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, verification badge or somebody, you know, like a Masonic Lodge, two people vouch for you to get you to come in. Um, how do we kind of address that? Because like most people seeing the NFT world, they're seeing crypto punks and bored apes and they're seeing these kind of communities that they're they're effectively locked out of. Um, how do we sort of convince people, I guess, you know, I don't know, through through art or design or what have you, that, you know, it is possible to sort of jump into these, you know, either discords or Twitter group chats or the comments section and actually like, you know, get things started from the ground up? Yeah, it's a good question. I think, um, I think some of the promise of crypto or maybe the like, maybe the... maybe there is some contradiction in that transparent markets or you know what maybe i'll i'll rephrase that the idea of what people's definition of fair is you know so like fair as decided by a completely transparent free market versus like fair as in like you know we're going to impose rules based on our ethical stance and I think that's like a, you know, it's a massive philosophical discussion about crypto for a bunch of reasons. The first being so many of the like people who decide the direction of the NFT community were like uh, contributors or however you categorize that. I don't know, but they're, you know, Ethereum billionaires that can essentially make markets. Mm -hmm. And there's, the, there's, one side of that argument is like, yeah, that's unfair. The other side is like, well, none of this would exist without that injection of capital, right? Um, so I think the frictionless nature of being able to create your own community or being able to participate without paying to be in a community um, is one step closer than what it was before, right? You can't go and like jump in the salesforce corporate discord and say hey guys what do you guys need any help with anything it's just not gonna happen yeah you can't um, just like step in and uh you know uh, desk ride with somebody i like an analyst at microsoft either right 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 well yeah maybe and maybe that will or the next microsoft well, maybe that's uh maybe that'll be completely different um and DAOs and decentralized um business entities or products can maybe address that i've got some like early thoughts on that that are like you know just by having a just by having a, like a trendy acronym describe what you're doing doesn't necessarily solve the very very difficult problem of organizing people and um the the subtle shift in, in incentives i think does create different outcomes but it's not like by itself it doesn't just create excellence right um mm. there's there's still a bunch of people problems and um skills that leaders that essentially need to set visions and um hold people accountable to the things that they say they're going to do and things of that nature so it rain, remains to be seen i think um obviously things like the ethereum protocol likely built this way so maybe it's uh maybe i'm not making a great point that you can't build like huge things in a completely decentralized way but um i'm rambling a little bit on this last point i think uh no i mean it, it more or less makes sense in terms of what you're saying regarding like DAOs being very nascent um and that totally kind of mirrors what i've seen um you know um and a lot of other people are seeing it as well i mean there are like some very good examples of decentralized organization working but um i think someone recently put out a tweet you know um like some DAOs have ceos still um which is quite crazy right um but yeah but going i mean w one question i mean we, we could definitely like talk more about DAOs. But one thing I, I definitely wanted to ask you about was essentially um the future of like nft um exchanges or platforms so you know you quite you've been on foundation for quite a while now um you know like maybe can you like run us through your thought process behind that um instead of just 
um, you know, having your own, mm-hmm. like minting on your own site or, you know, even OpenSea or, you know, w- w- what's your like thoughts behind that, your history and then, you know, probably your future. Yeah, great. So, so foundation, I originally made the decision based on, you know, my, my, uh, all my background is branding, advertising, um, and the foundation platform, like as a place to display product in the same way that you pick out a Shopify theme for displaying merch. I was like, Oh, this is pretty, I'm going to use this. This is before I really understood the NFT market, uh, at large. And since then I still use it, but I think my longer term vision is to ultimately like transition to something that is more consistent with the medium in terms of ownership of the, um, the tokens and the provenance of the tokens. So yes, you can tell that I minted something on foundation, but when it goes onto the secondary market, it still says, you know, verified foundation artwork. It's not, um, you can trace it back to visualized value, but it's not on a visualized value contract in the same way that you know, a board ape, um, the board ape marketplace is verified on OpenSea as board apes. And when you click board apes, you see the 10,000 pieces. Uh, so from a technical perspective, that's where I want to get to. This is more of a, like me taking my style of working, which is just like go and do what you can, when you can see what happens and then continue to iterate on it. I think I could still be, you know, sitting here paying people to build a before I understood the the implications of the NFT world in the way that I do now, so um, I think the the foundations of the world they do they definitely do serve a purpose. Um, I think that you know even they will need to evolve. I think to support better engagement on the secondary market. So I'm fortunate in. A lot of people I've spoken to maybe 80, 90% of people that have bought visualized value NFTs and their primary motivation is just, they've been um, consuming the work for two years, three years. And they're like, just want to support it. I want to hold it forever. Um, it's not like uh, let's speculate on the floor price of every asset here and like, like stare at the lowest price item on OpenSea for five hours on end every day. Um, I think, you know, everything that has its merits for some, for some, uh, projects and obviously the, the higher profile of an artist you are, that's just a natural market dynamic. I think to be completely candid, the way I've gone about it probably hasn't driven the most interaction on the secondary market, but that's something I think you can sort of fix retroactively. And part of my, um, involvement in this space i'm trying to be more transparent about how and why and um i don't think i don't think i fall into the category of the you know og crypto artists that just that can literally throw out a jpeg of something and because of their involvement and the respect that they've amassed through being early just have an insane amount of interest in their work so um i think mine's a little bit more of a uh out in the open iterative in the approach in the same way that building the visualized value education business worked that way too do, do you think there's a like a good opportunity for sort of the the opposite of that you, you sort of uh, um got after it a bit there talking about the person looking to buy like you know the jack butcher floor Right. Like I want right, to I want right. to get in on what you're doing later. I don't really care about you or any of your mm-hmm. art. I just want to make a piece of what you're making. Is there is there a like, good argument that that's helpful or that we should, you know, maybe build the infrastructure for that sort of speculating? Yeah, I, what's interesting is, you know, the like there's all of these like maximalists in their various fields have like this strange tendency to imagine a future where there's like one tool or one currency or one thing bitcoin is a good example of it ethereum is another um and even like marketplaces i i think OpenSea did something pretty remarkable in that like i'm fairly sure 
unless they intervene manually that you can just look at any um any nft on the ethereum blockchain through OpenSea, which is like a first of its kind marketplace right it's th that that kind of thing that's has correct, never yeah. ex existed before which is uh uh just really interesting and then you have all these other marketplaces coming up that are like okay you have to mint here sell here resell here um and there is like interoperability on the open sea side in in some ways but there's like there's some mismatch right if you don't if if the contract doesn't have um a certain type of specification or that metadata is not going to show up on open sea uh, foundation and open sea is a good example of like they work together but they're not kind of they're not really designed to work together right mm -hmm. um so i think long term i think something like open sea is gonna win because that's like who wants to be switching between nine different marketplaces in the same way that twitter has kind of won the narrative like the the tool where the narrative happens that's twitter you wouldn't have like five different networks i mean maybe some people do uh, like look in more places than i do obviously discord is in that mix but uh i imagine that maybe um maybe maybe these platforms have to start standardizing in a way that what you produce on these platforms shows up um in a way that people browsing on OpenSea trust it and can buy into it. So if I could publish to the, the vision foundation, I think that would make for a stronger uh, market on the back end on, on OpenSea. Same with Mirror. And those are really the only two I can comment on. I know Mirror is actually building that right now. Um, could you but, just, uh, sorry, could you repeat that there? Your, um, your mic went in and out right when you said sort of the key piece of that. <laughs> Oh really? Um, how far back should I go? Just just about thirty seconds. So, I think these these secondary platforms are all going to have to build with OpenSea in mind. So everything you publish on a foundation or a mirror would show up on OpenSea the same way that if you had the technical expertise to write your own contract and do your own front end. Um, that's the way things show up there because I think the, you know, maybe we'll even start to see WYSIWYG tools for building collections that display natively on OpenSea. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, that, that makes total sense. Um, I, I recently, I sent you a NFT, right? I transferred an NFT. Um, just out of curiosity, did you see that on OpenSea or did you see that on uh, Foundation? open sea i i don't think i could have seen it anywhere else um unless i looked in like um my Re metamask or rainbow so the wallet itself but i saw it on open sea and that's where i look at everything essentially yeah yeah um and i think i think what you said about open sea being a very transparent ability to see the actual blockchain i think um yeah that, that's a very interesting development and is a necessary development you know it's like um, the comparison of just having text on the internet versus just having, you know, text and image um, back in like 2000 or 1999 yeah. or whenever they started having images. Um, and we, we recently talked to um, someone from ENS, Brantley from ENS. He's, um, you know, nice, yeah. a big yeah. there. And, he, and, he, and he's saying, you know, th that's, that's going to be the future of, you know, having images natively in wallets. So like, you know, from MetaMask and stuff. But yeah. Um, definitely, um, you can, you know, um, with OpenSea, um, you can see pretty much anyone's NFT collection, which is, uh, you know, I, I think it's, the credit is rightly deserved, you know, in innovating that kind of space. Oh, it's un I think they are kind of under-recognized in what they've been able to build. I think they did 20 million in revenue in 2020 and then 4 billion in August this year which is just like, <laughs> how the hell do you build a product that can s support that, that rate of growth is, is remarkable. Yeah. And, um, I, I checked the gas, um, you know, allocation and they take up more than 25% sometimes of daily gas oh, or, no. you know, just, just through their own platform. And <laughs> that's crazy. So, you know, imagine all the, you know, layer twos, uh, imagine all your DeFi applications and open are just, you know, massively, massively, you know, outperforming anyone's crazy mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I, I um, someone wrote a tweet a while back that said, I think I said Discord is the new Bloomberg terminal, but I think op- it's probably more accurate to say, you know, open put Open C in that category, um, where you're just able to watch markets emerge in real time in a very different way than any other like i mean you can watch charts obviously on any uh charting software but there's something about this like additional layer of tangibility that i think just draws in more people right like the the number of people that are prepared to stare at like a five minute chart all day is much smaller than people who are like, Oh, that image went for X and my favorite, you know, basketball player just bought into this collection. It's just way more tangible. And like, I think it, it's, um, it's a much shorter leap to participation for people that aren't, you know, PhDs or just very into the idea of like arbitraging charts and spreadsheets and numbers uh, so I think that obviously has had played a huge part in the volume that OpenSea has seen and NFTs in general have just like exploded from. I used to um, I used to trade stocks, um, day trade them um, in a prop shop, and we had a uh, a market feed where we would listen and they would call out which banks were making buying and selling on the order. Uh, on, on the wow. order book and so when you heard morgan stanley or goldman or somebody like that switch to the bid well like you know it didn't matter what the charts say or what the numbers say you knew that like the big buyer had, had changed <laughs> right and you, 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 can, you can do the same thing on open sea right like you see a project taking off and if you see the same like you know maybe there's like a group of influencers that have been pumping projects and you see them in there well maybe you know that's one to stay away from versus if you see a like Mm. broad base of sort of respected people in the community or something like that then it's like oh that's a big signal like you know the the community actually wants this it's not just a pump yes i mean I'm sure there are smarter people than me uh, talking about this, but the weird parallel to like hedge fund manager X buying up a chunk of something and they're going on CNBC and either saying this is going to the moon or I've shorted this thing. It's a complete Ponzi scheme fraud. It's the same idea, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's pretty crazy. And it's all happening. Like, I don't think people realize, or this is because like there's a, there's a institutions have obviously done an incredible job of instilling this idea that they, what they say is true or they know what they're talking about beyond, you know, Joe blogs on Twitter. And that illusion is slowly shattering as we all know. And then like the permissionless nature of these markets is just, uh, I think it's just, taking that same dynamic and accelerating it to its extreme. Um, We're probably, you know, we're probably only at the nascent stages of that too. You saw it with uh, Wall Street Bets and Reddit and all this. uh, um, That's what, that's kind of a byproduct of things like Robinhood coming out that are reducing friction on buying and selling stocks. And now crypto, I think is, you know, that on steroids. You you mentioned the um, um, permissionless sort of systems and things like that. Um, you also mentioned about like uh, having a mentor in the education. Is is there like a is there an angle there for sort of NFTs or crypto to provide the infrastructure for a sort of trustless or like permissionless education system? You know, it's funny. Um... I think about this a, a fair amount and I think it's somewhat akin to the, the, um, I can, was it Sean Parker who said like the smartest minds of my generation are figuring out how to make people click ads. It was somebody involved mm. in early Facebook and, you know, as somebody who built an education business, um, I have just noticed how much more difficult it is to get people to pay attention to something that you might not have a payoff for a year, two years, three years. And, you know, that 
all of these systems kind of accelerate that a little bit. So you, you see people who you can watch this behavior happen. Basically anybody who gets into this world, like maybe they're running a business that's like has a very focused mission. And then two weeks later, they're like buying and selling pictures of toads on Twitter. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. And they, they instantly, it's kind of their appetite or their, um, their focus on opportunity really shifts in the short term. It's like they're at the casino and they're just rolling. Like, you know, they're hitting every number on the roulette table. It's like, why would I go back to work? Um, so I think the bigger question is like, how do you incentivize people to think long term and like get mm. into developing things that are, um, that are like, like I, lasting I, and meaningful and so on. Exactly. Yeah. I th and I think like one of my biggest regrets, uh, I, I, I just did not like STEM did not appeal to me as a kid, right? Like, um, maths, physics, freaking chemistry, computer engineering, like all of those things are like, how the hell do you incentivize people to study like things from first principles when, um, like you can, now it's feasible that you can make six figures a year, like, like speculating on things. And because of the, um, because of the, um, the, the volatility of it, it's almost like people aren't scared of getting wiped out. I don't know if you guys have, have um, I don't know if you guys have experienced that or observed that, but like, if there's like a thousand X opportunity on the table every couple of weeks, then I think people on their account um it's very strange and like i think the long-term implications of you know markets functioning this way and i think we do also have the tendency to be like oh eventually it'll calm down right like it will um somebody will come in or like culture will will um evolve to say like yeah this is done but if you look backwards maybe there's a quiet period but then when it comes back it just comes back even more crazily than it did in the last phase right yeah like there's um there's almost like a market for like the full-time speculator like alpha minor kind of person yes. right 100 percent. yeah 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 um yeah i mean that's that's half the reason why we're creating this podcast is because there's sort of a you know there's there's all this information out there and people aren't collating it people aren't putting it together people aren't making the like connections across the different like siloed areas of uh, of crypto so um we're excited about that i guess <laughs> yeah it's great it's great i think um like the other thing that that these these hype cycles do to people is like you lose um you know you lose you need a catalyst every week in a project for people to get excited about it again for example mm -hmm. so like the problem i think in a lot of cases is you start from the point of speculation and you know 99 of projects if you go in a discord it's like what's the floor price today yeah. right and that's like that's not a community that's like a trading pit in the same <laughs> way like you probably have experience in in a physical environment like that and it's yep. like everybody is there with one goal in mind and when that goal is becomes less uh feasible they'll just move to another pit versus like brands and things that have had um you know have built a relationship or uh, uh built a community without that component that can then like introduce it in an elegant way to reward people that have supported it before that was a part of the story um I think that long term, maybe that's where we see it happening. But the only counterpoint I would have to that is as soon as you get into this world and you start following certain people and you're in this like narrative bubble, you're like, oh, yeah, I love this thing, but I'm not making 100x on this overnight. So I'm going to switch to that other thing. It's very hard to just because it's such a nascent technology, it's hard to just get in and support one project because you're, you know, as a function of being in that world and being surrounded by people who are obsessed with it, you're going to hear about, Oh, I've just gotten into this and it's doing X, right. Or they're moving faster than this. So the, that's, um, uh, the like, like opportunity cost of being committed is very high right now. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Right. And that's uh, yeah, higher than it's ever been before. And you're, 
yeah, the, it feels like in a year or 18 months, the entire, you know, the entire way people evaluate opportunities and the way they should behave has, at least in this tiny, uh, uh, we should caveat this whole podcast with we're talking about, you know, one percent of the world's population that are on twitter and then 0.1 percent of them that are talking about nfts all day yeah yeah we're like the we we're talking about all these like siloed communities but they're all still within this one very small community <laughs> on the yeah picture. and because you it's like the elephant uh you know you're standing very close to the elephant and uh maybe if you zoomed out a little bit it wouldn't feel the same way it's like uh it's very hard to separate like what your reality is or how frequent something is is being talked about in your proximity versus how like you know walk down the street and ask anyone but i do think it is indicative of like what the bleed if this is what's happening at the bleeding edge over time you know we can we can expect a lot of this behavior to seep into the mainstream and you've always already got like massive sports franchises talking about this massive social media platforms like twitter verifying um nfts uh facebook talking about building metaverse products the nfl top shot all of that stuff so i don't think it's maybe it's not as crazy to say um it will be a pop culture phenomenon fairly soon but it's uh it is strange to think about what it will mean for how a lot of people will start to spend their time and how people think about opportunity cost yeah and uh just expanding on, on on this point of like community um one kind of analogy uh I've, I've, i use often is you know I, I kind of saw the community back in like 2017 and it was all around um different types of blockchains um and now you know i kind of came back 2021 um you know and kind of seen and you know delve very deeply into all the different communities and you know there's, there's a community that's just focused on nfts there's a community that's just focused on DAOs, and there's a community just focused on like DeFi, for instance. And then obviously, you know, this can be you know across different chains as well. So I, I think from that aspect, there's there's way more um, from an ecological sense. There's way more like texture of like ups and downs, and you know, all these different like different memes for different groups and stuff um, that have kind of risen. Um, and and that for me was kind of the um, you know like flash in the pan moment where like I was like, oh shit, you know, it's it's it's, it's finally taking off. Because there's all these different like use cases that are actually providing you know actual usability, and you can actually use you know the blockchain to actually do all this kind of stuff, which is kind of crazy compared to back in 2015, where you can just really buy stuff off the dark web. Um, yeah. So yeah, I, I think it's developing really quickly, um, and and the fact that we're even making this podcast just kind of shows that there's you know we we predict there's gonna be a huge interest uh, in NFTs for quite a while, and you know like it's 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 been NFT summer. As I say, um, yeah, yeah, this big time. so um, yeah, I, I think this is just the beginning, really. Um, and you know, I think what's, what's going to happen is going to it's going to like fractalize even more, and it's just going to become like it's going to become like email. You know, there's maybe there was like you know really hardcore fans of email back like 20 years ago, but over time, you know, your grandma uses it, um, and it's not that <laughs> you know crazy to talk about. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think that's a good point. And it's like, um, as as long as we're still referring to the name of the technology, you know, maybe it's not true because email, you would still say that. But like, you wouldn't say, um, I'm going to, you know, use Amazon on the internet. You're just like, I'm going to use Amazon. It's like, it becomes this layer that makes something possible rather than the way you refer to the thing. When it reaches an actual level of normalization, where you don't even talk about the technology that makes it possible. Yeah, um, I, I I think that's a huge, huge, huge um, aspect of like using technology. And when people say like um, they complain a lot about NFTs, and when they do that, I'm like, you know, NFTs are just going to be like PDFs eventually. Um, exactly. Yeah. 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 Hundred percent. You know, like you can just buy and sell PDFs, right? You can, you know, you can upload them gun road or whatever but this this gets rid of that centralized aspect um but yeah i i, I think that's a sorry i was just gonna say like there have been some pretty intense like twitter mobs popping up about i don't know if you guys saw that chris dixon twitter yeah. tweet thread did you see like he yeah. got like 
ended for that. There's so many like crazy responses in there. And the idea of ownership, I think, is the thing that really sets people off. Like, what do you mean own a piece of the internet? Like, how dare you try and own a piece of the internet? And it's it's I don't really know if I've wrapped my head around why that is the issue, but that seems to be the thing where people really like lose their minds. The idea of artificial scarcity and ownership in the context of something that people, I don't know, think is free or think no one owns, which is obviously a misconception in itself. Um, what do you guys think about that? I think there's like, um, NFTs make public the sort of private clubs that have existed for a long time. And it's mm, just, mm -hmm. uh, people are aware of how sort of not in the club they are now. And I think that, yeah, that would make sense with to the response that it elicits. Yeah. <laughs> And so it's, uh, they kind of see these people that have, you know, either were early or connected or just, you know, had money from either venture capitalists, communities, you know, Silicon Valley kind of thing, have all sort of got into this early. They're all here on Twitter saying that, like, this is the future. And it's almost like people conceive that as like, they're um, like, you know, I don't need a feudal like lord to look over my internet like i don't i don't want you right there's this uh, it's almost like a um like a guttural reaction kind of thing yeah and it's the the incredible irony of it is that all of these things are being expressed on platforms where your effort and energy is literally being my of the largest most profitable businesses on the planet <laughs> Cool. Um, I, I just wanted to get back into communities because uh, you, you mentioned that you had a community um, around visualized value and through your courses, and that's how you kind of got like NFT pilled, um, you know, through some people. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. you know, my my kind of question is around like, you know, are, are you going to foster that, or how are you going to um, essentially channel that, or you know, if someone else wanted to, you know, do something very similar to like creating a community. Um, you know, what kind of advice would you give, you know, especially yeah. in crypto? Yeah, you know, what's fascinating is the whole Web3 NFT world has been like, I thought it would be really niche within the couple thousand people that are part of the visualized value community on any given day is, you know, they either came to visualize value through following one of the the Instagram or the Twitter accounts. So the ideas that were being represented visually resonated with them, or they like purchased and went through a course, one of which was that permissionless apprentice idea. The other was a design course and the and the the third one is a knowledge productization course. And the number of people that have like pivoted into learning solidity, writing NFT contracts or like selling art has just been astounding to me. Uh, and I think it's, there's a few reasons. I think one is like the, just the crazy wave of hype, right? Like you can, this is the like throw a dart anywhere and you can maybe find some success if you're in a market that is just incredibly hungry for um, anything. And like the, the demand is just not, uh satiated by the supply so there's that but there's also like the things that motivated people to get into visualized value were earning income on the internet or like operating independently and there's so many principles in like that this technology that overlaps with those ambitions that now in hindsight it makes total sense that people are really gravitating towards it um, the advice on the community building front, I think the, like finding a unique way to express the, you know, the way you see the world is really the, like, that's the, the magnet for whatever community you're going to build and visualize value. I was like, 
almost happens by accident. And I think the, this is like, this sucks to hear as advice, but it's like, if you're trying to build a community, you're not going to build a community. So like, if you, you know, if you like go to a party or an event or whatever, and your objective by like any means possible is to meet people and make friends, you're probably going to turn off everyone. Right. It's like the, um, I don't know. I don't even know what the social phenomenon is, but people well, are probably the, familiar it, with that idea. It's like the reeks of desperation kind of thing. Right. Exactly. Right. Like, Hey, jo come and join my community. Like you imagine walking up to someone in a party and saying, Hey, you want to be part of my community? It's like, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> um, so it's like, it has to be this natural byproduct of what you're already doing where, um, grit. I think you did that years ago with, um, discord. I remember joining your discord before I even knew what discord was. And I was like, what the hell is this? I'm old as hell. I don't, I can't figure this out. Um, <laughs> And I don't think you were doing anything like, hey, the grit cult community is, these are the benefits and come and do this. And that it's like, no, there's a link in the Twitter bio. And if you like what grit cult is maniacally tweeting about, then you're probably going to enjoy this as well. Uh, so that's like the frustrating thing about trying to explain this stuff is like the, the, you have a better shot at it, the less you're thinking about it, which is, you know, now I've introduced that idea that actually makes it harder. So it's pretty funny how that works. Well, but, um, yeah, like just on. to just to sort of put that, you know, more simply, it's like don't try and build a community. Just like do things that other people will want to do, and then invite them to join you. Yeah, exactly. Like you, the the idea of any community is, is there's there's a point of shared appreciation for something. It might be. You know, a certain brand of humor might be a style of art, might be a football team, might be whatever. Um, but the way you get people to want to be part of that is you just basically, um, you are experiencing that feeling publicly and it's a magnet for other people that want to experience that. So, um, and obviously the way that comes to life is very, very specific to the individual. If you try to follow anyone else's playbook, then you're, you know, you're, it kind of falls apart because it's not you and people can yeah. sense that at a biological level that somebody's pretending to be something that they're not. Yeah, no, um, I, I, I t there's so many things to go into just from those comments. It's just like, you know, um, what we're seeing now with crypto and technology in general is, you know, and I've told Pat this is like, you know, we can do an entire series of like, you know, podcasts just based on the nature of identity in Web3. Um, and now we're talking about communities. And, you know, one thing that a lot of people on Twitter and I've been tweeting about for a very long time is, you know, how crypto is essentially going to change, you know, nation states. So like now I'm looking to move, um, you know, to a different country, mainly because like I I'm not restricted to where I work, um, you know, based on geography. It's, it's more about, you know, people and, you know, what's going to be tax efficient and all these other kind of things that come into play. Um, so yeah, like th that's, a, that's a huge kind of thing. And I think, you know, going back to incentive mechanisms, it's like, I, I think someone said that um, because you don't have as much US dollar in your bank account, you you're less likely to be, um, you know, economically aligned with America, right? You're going to be more economically aligned with, let's say Bitcoin, if you're holding mm -hmm. 100 Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, I mean, what it's going to do to the way people behave. I, th I mean, I think it's already happening, but we're still the, the, the narrative just takes a long time to catch up with it. Uh, yeah, the, the fractionalization of everything is I think you can view it in two ways. One is that like people are getting driven further apart and it's bad for um, it's, it's a net negative for the world at large. The other is like people are finding their people and sort of minding their own business in that, in those little tribes. So it's like this digital localism argument where you say, Hey, just because you were born in a place where people don't care about the same things that you do, doesn't mean you can't like align yourself economically with the things you care about. So I think the optimistic version of it is the latter half of that argument. Yeah, if um if sort of web 2.0 helps you find your community, web 3.0 allows you to kind of uh maybe actually work together on something, actually collaborate with those 
uh, without having to go through another institution, whether that be Facebook or Twitter or what have you. Yeah, I think I like. I think the fascinating thing I was talking about this this morning. I'd I'd be interested to hear what you think about it. But most work is complete nonsense. Like mm. the my entire career, I learned tangible skills, but I was kind of applying them against ideas or objectives 90 percent of the time maybe it wouldn't even see the light of day but we've all collectively agreed to the fact that we need to get paid make money and you know uh especially if you're working in marketing or consulting you're not like curing cancer or sending shit to the moon it's just there's a massive massive segment of the modern economy that is just sort of nonsensical and pointless in a lot of ways i used an example on twitter this morning about the administrative layers in an insurance company yeah it's just crazy the things <laughs> like, that people get paid to do and they spend decades of their lives doing the same thing every day it's like yeah. there are so many jobs that could be like coded away tomorrow but at the same time what are all those people going to do so i think that like this idea or this like phenomenon that's happening naturally is just people figuring out a way to monetize dicking around on the internet essentially like making pictures of monkeys and like playing games and earning money to play games it's a, it's a weird like i'm sure grit you have a both of you guys if you're uh connected over twitter i know you've talked about this as well as like the collective um like the collective organism is just finding a as well around the corner or it's starting to like get prodded by these realities that are like, okay, we can see this is about to collapse. What the hell are we going to do next? Let's invent another imaginary economy that at least is fun to fuck around in. Yeah. Um, it's, it's actually so funny that you mentioned this because literally, you know, five minutes before you hopped on the call, um, me and Pat, I was just telling Pat, I was, I was creating a, um, a proposal for a potential client. Um, and, you know, you've probably done like marketing or like consulting proposals, right? Like they, they kind of want all the um, juice without squeezing. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So, you know, and I was like, you know, I, I don't really do this kind of stuff. You know, if someone wants to work, they'll want to work. Um, and so I just kind of have a template or something. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I totally kind of understand that. And, and a lot of it is just like turning the wheels. And I think um, what's been abstracted for, for a very, very long time is this notion of value against price or like, you know, labor and stuff. Um, and that's a very kind of common argument I hear, you know, from a lot of kind of people is that, um, you know, the amount of hours you put in is like equal to something what's like mm -hmm. it's, it's mm -hmm. directly equal to value. Right. Which is which is not true. You know, you can have different types of value. You could, and obviously <laughs> we're talking to you, you know, you, you've you've got a huge kind of like you. I think you had it at value. Right. I once. Yeah, um, I got taken away, but I did have <laughs> it at one point. <laughs> exactly. So you know, you kind of you kind of get where we're, where we're going with this. Um, you know, it's it's like there's loads of ways of interpreting value. So, um, and I think what crypto does, it, it kind of re reduces kind of abstractions because it it, it gets you as close to um, the API as possible. And there's um, I'm I'm not sure if you're familiar with a of a, of a guy called VJR. Uh, yeah, I've been reading his tweets the last like maybe two weeks ago i started following him i love i love his stuff yeah so he, he he's a um he, he's a he's a he's got he's written a lot on corporate structure and he's written a lot on um essentially consulting at a very high high kind of level and you know he came up with the ricky gervais principle um you know how to like keep the wheels turning at a job and it's not about competency but it's rather about you know playing the social, social games but um go, going to the point um, he, he mentions a concept regarding um, like below the API and above the API. So, you know, he, he, he proposes this dichotomy where, um, you know, like most people, so Uber drivers, um, they live below the API because the API is telling them what to do and what not to do. Wow. And, and Uber essentially is above the API. They're like controlling the API. So I think what crypto is doing is kind of changing that dichotomy and reducing a lot of the abstraction and i think technology in general is just pushing us towards um you know flatlining you know like in an organization you can get away with like doing nothing for a year two years right 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 you know like that's just playing it safe like i know i know people that actually 
actively, you know, they cost the company more money than they they're worth. Um, uh, yes, yeah, so many people. <laughs> I, yeah, yeah. Please. So I, I think what crypto is doing is like it's, it's making that clearer. You know, like you can see all the value that's been transacted on the blockchain, for instance. Yeah, I think that's great. I mean, I've got to read that above and below API. I've been using, maybe I subconsciously stole this from like scrolling past his stuff, but I've been talking about making, like make yourself an API. Like if you want to transition from web two to web three and, you know, in the same way, Pat, you were talking about, I can animate X, like you're an API that then plugs into a community of people that have assets to animate and they know what you're good at then you can become that for them mm -hmm. and i like i also think the like speculation class or the investor class is a response to you know how many do we need four billion apis can there even be four billion apis how is that going to work um that to me is like we're weirdly good at like anticipating and this this behavior that looks like completely irrational nonsense right now is, you know, in 10 years time, it's like, oh yeah, that was an obvious point of transition from yeah. when people just like drove to work to sit in a cubicle all day to, you know, to save people from like, I don't know, wandering the streets all day. They, they sit at home and like talk about the things they love and bet money on it. Yeah. I've been, um, I've been reading a lot about cities and, um, infrastructure investment and things like that. And, uh, I, I compare this to like the, the railroad boom in the sort of early 1800s mm. often where they, they built out way more rail infrastructure than was like ever needed due to like rampant, crazy speculation. And a lot of people went bankrupt because they invest invested too early, but that investment in that railroad, like uh you know 20 30 years later when the like second phase of the industrial revolution took off that infrastructure was there and i think the difference now of course is that the the cycles are so much faster that i don't think we'll be waiting for these investors in the sort of new infrastructure i don't think they'll be waiting very long to see that being used yeah i, I agree and i i think there's like just a like a wholesale paradigm shift of, I don't know whether it's um, are you, I'm not an economist and I don't like have enough expertise to comment on monetary policy, but it feels just like all of the rules are breaking around money, right? All of the like things that we thought or we believe to be true have like kind of are just falling apart and behavior is all downstream of like incentives and money and uh that to me is just like a really bizarre uh like the the uh the implications of that are going to be really bizarre and this is going to be like a very significant chapter in world history in hundreds of years if people are still documenting it in hundreds of years uh where like oh yeah do you remember when like people used to go to offices 40 hours a week and just like stare at spreadsheets how how odd is that in the same way that like 95 percent of people will be like toiling the fields in uh you know 150 yeah. 200 years ago yeah i think it's um like i i think i think the implications of it is um it, it's quite similar to the the mercantile age um and you know i i did study economics and one of, one of my complaints was that none of it was relevant um you know then you had like new theories like mmmt which still don't account for crypto um and you know like the technical integration of you know the internet into economies is it's, it's just so out there that like i haven't i haven't really read anything you know um from anything and i've, I've literally tweeted out that you know, if you're reading anyone from the 20th century um, in terms of economics, there's no point because right. it doesn't really apply. Yeah. Right. Um, you know, it's, it's all been thrown out the window for for longer than this, even, right? Yeah. The the one uh, thing I constantly reference is that David Bowie video. Have you seen that one? With is that with Parkinson or uh, some British TV host where he talks about the internet? Have you seen that clip? 
Yeah, 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 yeah. I remember. I, I saw it years ago, but yeah, you know, he talks about how it's going to change the world and it's going to be revolutionary, right? Yeah, he's like, he's like, yeah, but the internet's just a tool, isn't it? He's like, no, man, it's an alien life force. Like the things that it's going to do to the way the world works are <laughs> unfathomable. Like you can't even begin to comprehend what it's going to do, both good and bad. I think he says, and. um yeah, if anyone's listening to this, is curious, just type in, I think, David Bowie internet interview in YouTube, you'll find it. And the, like, it's so prescient. And I almost every time I watch it, I'm like, wow, it's ama it amazes me that we've like self regulated for this long. That this yeah. thing hasn't yeah. hasn't like gone completely out of control. We've somehow like, you know, we settle into this rhythm of collaboration and slowly like, you have a crazy pocket of people innovating on something and then for it to get mainstream adoption, it can't quite be that extreme because like most people could not tolerate living that way on a daily basis. So it kind of self-regulates, but um, yeah, he was uh, just a uh, amazing thinker. On the, on the sort of subject of um, things either kind of getting out of hand or, you know, not really, you know, even being able to understand maybe like what what this is all going to look like five ten years from now is there something you're like particularly excited about that you imagine on the horizon is there anything um that you're like kind of excited for the the tech to realize i, I what i'm curious about is like you guys remember bit clout mm -hmm. yeah very much still going now i think they're uh i think they've just um launched a new to it's like DSO decentralized so but the idea like I started playing around with that just because uh you know sort of my my business and um mm -hmm. the idea of assigning like a market cap to someone and to like everything you own and to every decision you make in real time is like I wonder if that's gonna be um, if that's going to get to a point where, you know, the response to social media initially was like, this is stupid. This is like, why would it like, I think there is a way more awareness of what that would do to someone's like self-esteem or mental health. I think there's something about that that would really slow down the adoption of this stuff in general. Mm -hmm. but, um, uh, yeah, sorry, go ahead. I was just saying, but at the same time, like when it reaches critical mass, it's like most people adopt it anyway, despite the um, despite the obvious implications. It's like if you want to if you want to participate in society at large, this is kind of the cost, right? Yeah, like for example, five years ago, everybody knew that Facebook was listening to you on your phone. Does that stop people Correct. from using Correct. it? No, 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 not really. Exactly right. right. And um, something like doing like a personal IPO or ICO or whatever sounds awful and nightmarish maybe to people now. <laughs> exactly. Right? Yeah, yeah. But like once people start doing it and you see your your buddy instead of taking, you know, a hundred grand of student loans, he went and, you know, sold 10% of his earnings for a million dollars. People are going to follow suit, right? Yeah, I, 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 yeah, I'm, I'm very skeptical that it will get like just in this current moment. It's like, how would the hell would that happen? But knowing what we know about other like massive technological transitions, I mean, I think maybe my, my, uh, doubt is unfounded, honestly. Yeah, I think I, I'm, I'm very familiar with BitCloud. I work with people that have worked with BitCloud directly. Um, you know, I've, I've kind of dissected their playbook, um, and I, I mean, it's very interesting what they kind of did and how they did it. Um, and I think, you know, my kind of thoughts are that, you know, like an artist, even a thousand years ago, I mean, not a thousand, maybe like a hundred years ago, like, um, Da Vinci or uh, Van Gogh, for instance, they, they lived a life where like economic success of their kind of artwork was directly tied to like how good they were right or how well perceived they were and with something that's so subjective um you know there's so many different other factors that come come into it and like marketing and all this other kind of stuff so i think i, I think the world is tending to that kind of way 
Um, but I think I think crypto is going to like crystallize it in a way that hasn't really been seen before. Um, I, I'm personally like, you know, like I'm, I'm not a huge fan of like, you know, putting numbers behind it or uh, attaching numbers to everyone. You know, it's so, like mm -hmm. had a follower account, and now you're gonna have like, you know, how much you earn in Ethereum. Essentially, um, it's it's gonna get like messy. Um, but but I think humanity has like encountered it. Um, you know, like those kind of hierarch hierarchical systems before but i think with crypto what, what it's going to be is it's going to be in a way where you can earn like a lifetime's worth of income very quickly um and because like we're, we're growing at what i perceive to be an expansion exponential you know 100 year bull run <laughs> um you know i, I think what's going to happen is that more and more people their their basic standards of living are going to increase um you know Eliminating, eliminating poverty but not necessarily eliminating um you know differences or injustice or not injustice but like you know discrepancies between earnings. relativity right yeah 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 exactly yeah. relative poverty can get a lot worse while eliminating absolute poverty agreed yeah. agreed exactly that, exactly that. yeah um, i mean who was it balaji said if uh what was it if bitcoin hits 100k then half the world's billionaires will be um crypto just from buying crypto which is just an insane just an insane idea right that the the all of that capital has just been people didn't even necessarily build anything they just had conviction that, that um they bet on a direction in which the they thought the world was going to go and then it went that way like, what are the implications of that? It's pretty nuts. So it's just very interesting to kind of loop that back around to uh, what we were talking about uh, an hour or so ago there around opportunity cost. So in a time when opportunity cost is so high, people are rewarded for sort of sticking with their bet, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, just to add to that, I mean, like hindsight is twenty twenty. you know, so like, yeah. you know, in a hundred years time, we'll be like, oh yeah, it made perfect sense. Why did so many people lose money? But, um, you know, looking forward, there was like so many different competitors and narrative was not clear, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, there's a, there's a lot of factors in that equation and just buying and holding, I think is a huge kind of thing. I think what also happens is um, <clears throat> like with, with, you know, what I was explaining regarding, um, and re relative and absolute poverty so what i kind of believe we happened with the crypto market was that people that were already um you know very rich right they kind of like all compounded into the nft market uh, and this made the nft market boom but what that what, what the nft market has also done is like it's minted more millionaires that are gonna essentially give back to their communities right so yeah you know it's, it is like it's more trickle down um you know you know yeah so in in that sense you know i think that there's going to be an increased you know flow of capital so you know going back to opportunity cost so like if you if you make all, a lot of money like millions through one um you know random shit going you know doing a hundred thousand x or whatever um <laughs> you know like you, you can make that money consolidate it you know, transfer it to like a more blue chip kind of coin like ethereum or bitcoin and then what you can do you can invest in nfts and i'm i'm, I'm literally seeing this happen um all across the market yeah, and this is what this is uh, my um, the point I was making earlier is like people just keep rolling the dice, right? If there are if there are outcomes that are that way off the mean, then like the people that are taking just obscene risk over and over and over again, the the I mean the only the only counterpoint to that is like you have to like eventually turn the sensible switch right to your point grit where it's like you get your thousand x and then you're like okay i'm gonna get out of the game now or i'm gonna at least transition to a more sustainable game but i think even before this crypto conversation that's like emerging in culture where like i don't know 30 percent of americans have a robin hood account and maybe like a ridiculous number of people are buying AMC stock and GameStop mm. stock, knowing full well that like they're not investing in the company, they're playing a financial game in the same way that the people ha that have a thousand X outcome over them are playing 
a different side of that financial game. And like people are, I think, starting to realize like, hang on a minute, all of this stuff is just like something that I didn't have access to or know about. And I'm going to start putting some chips on the table because like you're, you're either like just in this one X mode or a thousand X mode. Does that make sense? It's a bit of a weird idea, but the incentives to gamble are pretty high right now because the upside is ridiculous. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. And, totally. and um, go ahead, Pat, you go. So, sorry. I was just like, and to your point earlier too, like you don't need a Bloomberg terminal and tw- like a $20,000 <laughs> subscription to right. do this anymore. Right. right. Like you can do it from your smartphone with a hundred dollars. Yeah, crazy times, crazy times, and then you just get back in the Uber for a couple of weeks and get your next casino chips if it if it goes wrong. Yeah, so really... I mean, I've heard a lot of like scary stories as well. I've heard people, you know, take slightly wrong turns at pivotal moments, um, and it's, it's gone terribly wrong. You know, and there's probably more of those kind of stories than there are like positive ones. Oh, hundred percent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. You're right. Like people trade with leverage, and you know, oh, they're like, right. you can get in really, really scary spots, and it's not like for the most part. <laughs> like I'm talking about people who are like taking calculated risks repeatedly, rather than like betting the farm on something. It's uh, yeah. It should. It's like by no means anybody listen to this should you know do any of that <laughs> stuff. Cool. Um. I mean, the only real kind of question I have um, that we prepared earlier was, you know, regarding NFTs and, you know, avatars and identity, um, you know, because I I have, I remember when we kind of first sent you the questions, you know, you, you were tweeting something along those lines, I can't really remember off my head, but, you know, what, what do you think in terms of like these generative avatar projects, um, you know, like me personally, I think they're kind of running out of steam and we're kind of seeing, um, you know, a new next wave of NFT projects. You know, what are your kind of just immediate thoughts and, you know, we just mm. go from there. Yeah, I think um, the historic projects maybe have like have a shot at lasting relevance, but it's definitely a like you could you could time it absolutely perfectly. Essentially, when that board eight project came out, you know that like a thousand teams went to ground as like, let's just replicate this. And then the amount of time on average it took to build that meant that like there was five of them coming out a day for the next three months and i think it's like i've i don't know i haven't spent that much time in those other like in those um projects that haven't gotten the momentum but i think it goes back to what we were talking about before it's like um the i missed out on x so this is the next thing is just yeah, it's just a like a very risky strategy, and ninety nine point nine eight percent of that stuff is is going to zero. Probably similar, although I wasn't participating actively to the twenty seventeen ICO stuff. Right, there are probably a handful of people that made life changing money in that um, boom of ICOs, and then there's hundreds of thousands of people that just got completely wrecked and never came back to crypto again. So it feels like a hundred percent that that's going to be, um, yeah, that's going to play out here as well. At some point is just, uh, this, I don't know. I don't know. I, I, um, also go back to your tweet grit, uh, the hundred year bull run. I love that idea. And like, I wonder if the bear markets we experience now are like a week or three days. And then just everything is just cyclically getting faster and faster, both up and down. Uh, and that's like thermodynamics, right? Entropy. It just feels like the, the idea of this space going into hibernation for six months or a year to me just feels like, I just don't think it's possible at this point. But again, maybe that was the same feeling people had in 2017. And I'm on the, like, this time it's different train. But I feel like the space is a bit more mature. There's so many people that have skin in the game and people get shook out and wrecked on a daily basis. It's not like everything goes up constantly. There's like these little micro economies that are 
booming and busting in real time rather than like whole space getting taken out for months on end yeah i've i've noticed that myself just from crawling around a lot of discords and on twitter the last month that um you know this this bear market in nfts if you can even call it that in september has been seen um you know more of a flight to either quality the and like the um original projects but also just ones that are like have active communities that are involved have devs that are pushing he said like new content to like on a weekly basis whether that's new you know uh, events or collaborations or what have you um i'm i'm seeing that that kind of flight to quality happen almost quickly yes th those are like i think the projects as well that are going to experience the um or that that the that have the the highest chance of success are the ones that don't depend on constantly making new promises mm -hmm. like the the consensus that people have around something like a crypto punks right where the devs uh, lava labs are basically they, they don't do anything i mean they're doing stuff behind the scenes but they're not having to like go out and tweet every week hey this thing's coming next week or that thing's yeah. coming next week it's that's kind of like the if you were to compare them to a startup it's like they have product market fit and there's like public consensus on this stuff to the point where they're like, you know, they're a collectible in their own right and they exist. And as long as they keep paying the website hosting for people to transact on the, on the um, collectibles, it seems like that's going to carry on versus a project that's like, so announcements and teams executing, that's no different than, like um, the quarterly conference call of a, a Fortune 500 company, right? Where someone gets on and then analysts like listen to it and be like, okay, we're going to buy or we're going to sell. Um, and a lot of times these teams have way less um, skin in it. They might be anonymous or they might be like, um, you know, they haven't got like a fiduciary responsibility or they haven't signed contracts and things of that nature. So uh, the more dependent these projects are on, like three people executing amazingly f until the end of time, the more, you know, wary I would be about them. Yep. Yeah. Um, that, that's definitely an interesting point regarding like teams and, you know, just decentralized teams. Um, I mean, there's, there's a few trends I've kind of noticed in the NFT space is like, um, you know, there, there are projects that are trying to like create DAOs now. Um, so like the release a collection, and that collection basically means an entry to a DAO. And then from that DAO, you get X amount of revenue share split, um, much like um, how they did with like initial, you know, meme tokens, right? Shit coins, whatever you want to call them. Like there, there was these like different phases of the, of the cycle, right? There's like, you'd have Dogecoin, Dogecoin, right? And then you'd have SafeMoon, which was a slight innovation in the sense that every transaction basically means people who hold a token or the early adopters they'll get a percentage of, uh, of the, you know, money traded as a reflection, you know? So that was, that was one, one innovation. And then the other one was essentially like charity coins. Um, you know, I, I, I talked to a few charity coins and, you know, every week what they'll do is just send money to charity and then I'll be a huge, um, you know, promotional in a, uh, event. Um, and then it'll just like kind of, you know, keep the wheels turning and then, you know, suppliers going down. Um, so I, I, th I think, I think these are very, very kind of interesting aspects of like kind of seeing how meme tokens happened and how that's kind of happening in the NFT space. But I think with the NFT space is slightly different because you, you have a much smaller, you know, upper cap, right? So you have like 10,000, whereas um, NFT tokens, for instance, I mean, normal meme tokens, crypto tokens, right? They, they were fungible. So, you know, you can change them um, pretty mm -hmm, easily mm -hmm. for like a lot of different things. Whereas with this, the liquidity and, you know, the art is, is very different. And what tends to happen in art markets, it's um, it, it just keeps going up in a recession as well, because uh, people buy it as you know, especially blue chip stuff. Um, so like the total dyna economics behind it is uh, is very very different in my opinion. Yeah, people aren't buying Safe Moon to show off how much Safe Moon they have. <laughs> right, right, right. But um, yeah, I, I think um, that's more or less it from me. Pat, did you have any more questions? 
Um, nothing real specific. We've kind of went over everything we wanted to talk about. Um, is there anything you had there, Jack, that you wanted to either uh, pitch or bring up or anything you, f- you feel like we missed about what you're doing right now? No, I thought this was, um, this was a fun conversation. I think we definitely unearthed some uh, worms, man, that are going to be uh, burying deep into my brain for the coming weeks. I, one thing... Um, I don't think we used the, or I don't think we discussed the idea of a Ponzi scheme just yet, which is uh, like (laughs) the, the common response. I know we talked about like own the internet, blah, blah, blah. Like the, the consensus outside of the crypto echo chamber is that, you know, crypto is, is destroying the world and it's a Ponzi scheme. And, um, you know, the 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 knee jerk response to a lot of these technologies, I think like this may be a controversial thing to say, but like Ponzi scheme is such a incredibly well like well branded mm-hmm. idea. Yeah, be- because it, it kind of it, it you it, know it's like this viral idea that like it's almost early people shouldn't be rewarded. Yeah, and it's also like how does any thing grow right it's like people it's the the difference between a ponzi scheme and a successful asset of of some kind is like very it the the line gets hazier and hazier right like how is so someone would say oh the board ape universe is a ponzi scheme right or um soho house is a ponzi scheme like there's there's a argument to make for the way certain businesses are structured even if the um investors that you know there is a like we work as a ponzi scheme i think there's just like it's kind of a if a business fails if it's set up a certain way it can be branded that way and more often than not um like is intention the difference in that situation? Like is if somebody set it up with the intention to defraud people or if they just kind of uh, made some missteps and they had to, you know, accelerate their recruitment or adoption of their product in some way to uh, fulfill on their promises. I just think it's a really interesting, like underexplored idea. And it's obviously a, uh, obviously something that gets brought up by, um more often than not people that aren't aren't building anything so it's just a it's just a fascinating uh a fascinating term that i think just is uh so well branded and just triggers like uh mobs yeah, very yeah, easily yeah it, yeah it has a lot of depth you know it, it's been further sort of confused in people's minds with the like um popularity of multi-level marketing as well mm. So like people, people will use the word Ponzi scheme to, and, you know, interchangeably with, with that idea, um, which again is, you know, is, is that predatory? Is that, especially if like, you know, um, you know, what's, what's the intention there, right? Like there's, like you mentioned about the ICOs, like there's plenty of ICOs that were created with plenty of good intentions with teams that, you know, Mm -hmm. wanted to create something that was actually helpful for people and it just didn't work. Yeah, yeah. I mean, t- 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 touching on like what the nature of a Ponzi scheme. A Ponzi scheme is something where you deliberately set up to entice new buyers, and then you basically rug them. You know, mm-hmm. so like you, <laughs> the the later buyers are going to pay for the early buyers' profits, um, and you know, essentially a pyramid scheme as well, or a multi-level marketing scheme. Um, I, I think that is true in certain aspects of crypto. And the reason why mm-hmm. I say that is because like certain tokens and certain people who make these tokens, they are essentially creating something that they know they're going to cash out on. So they're going to create like a product and then essentially, you know, get rid of that product from their ownership. Right. Um, and that's the way I kind of see it. And we had a guest earlier, you know, I think a couple of months ago now, like in August or something, um, in Vinay Gupta. And he basically said that this is malicious um, in nature. So like you're maliciously, got the intent of creating something that you that you know is not going to be a long-term project mm. and a lot of the time these projects they promise oh yeah we've got xyz coming in the roadmap and you know that's not the truth 
um, and, and that constitutes, you know, a, a legal um, crime in, in many, many respects. But with NFTs or like legitimate projects is that there's baked in utility or there's baked in value. So for instance, when someone buys your NFT because they want to support you, that's not exactly a Ponzi scheme because, you know, they want to do it and they don't have the intention of, you know, reselling um, or you don't have the re intention of rugging. Uh, and the thing is with NFTs is, it's a lot harder to make that argument because you know you're 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 selling artwork essentially, and because of the nature of liquidity, it's it's not as um, there's no there's no real rug to pull um, from the community aspect other mm. than you know abandoning the project, um, which you know it, it does happen. But again, it's like that kind of argument is slowly dissipating. Um, but like you know back in 2015, it was probably not in 2015 when the ICO boom happened. There were a lot of projects that were just getting millions and millions of you know dollars essentially um and they were essentially rugging and um you know those were not in the best of intentions but um a lot of people did make money a lot of people lost money you know indeed indeed no that's yes uh that was a good bit um yeah but man. um yeah i think i think that's more or less it unless you were, you were going to say something there no, I just wanted to talk about uh, Ponzi schemes, pyramid schemes. <laughs> <laughs> because I think we're going to be hearing that term a lot in the coming years. Yeah, like yeah. There, the, the, there's got to be a way to um, so soften that idea, I guess, that like, I, I don't know, like, because p people automatically assume that sort of anything built with that kind of structure assumes that you're planning like grid says to rug them or you're planning to like deceive people but like mm -hmm. uh, yeah it's a it's a negative connotation that we probably need to shake yeah and i think it's like um this uh, this argument of utility is what gets like really dicey right it's like people i think don't think deeply about what utility is in 2021 for somebody who's already like fed watered clothed uh, housed utility then becomes about like how you spend your free time how you entertain yourself who you um you know hang out with like utility people kind of make the argument that this has no use but uh obviously depending again going back to the idea of relativity that we talked about depends who you are right Dep like a million dollar a year golf club membership has no use to me because i can't swing a golf club but to somebody else it's you know it's all they want to do every day i'm sure plenty of the people who um you know went on bernie madoff's yacht saw plenty of utility, <laughs> utility in their investment utility, right exactly, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah no i uh yeah it's i think we basically we lack the vernacular and the vocabulary to grasp a lot of these concepts and i'm sure this was like how conversations happened around the internet when it was coming about it's like it, you're just at the nascent edge of this thing that's just fundamentally changing the way people interact in such a profound way that i mean i personally am admitting that i don't have the language to describe it a lot of the time yeah um th there was a phrase back in the 90s or 80s right it, it was called cyberspace but now no one uses that. But now, you know, we call right. it another term called metaverse. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think the language will get there eventually, but because it's just changing so quick. Um, back when I was, in, you know, quite heavily into crypto, like earlier, you know, like 2017, 2018, there wasn't a word for DeFi, uh, even though that we knew that eventually we could build apps and dApps on, um, you know, crypto blockchains. You know, there's no word for DeFi, and it came about in a group chat in of the ethereum developers i think um you know and, and that's totally fascinating in terms of how things just like you know proliferate um and and yeah um that that's, Man, I, I, think... I was gonna say your cyberspace comment is is like that clicked something for me it's like you can think that you're on the edge of something but you're gonna look back at what you were doing mm -hmm. or how you were talking in five years you're like what mm -hmm. an idiot you know like the yeah 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 um we but, have such a poor ability to forecast outwards um <laughs> like the uh, incredible 
the blogosphere is is one of my favorite ones oh yeah Recently, that's a classic that, that one's that's gonna stick classic. with me a while <laughs> blogosphere, blogosphere. Yeah. <laughs> yeah i mean like I, I think what people try to do is you know they're always trying to invent language and trying to like you know capsulate um what exactly is going on at the time um but yeah i mean we're we're pretty much close to like two hours which is fascinating you know it's just gone by so quick um but yeah i mean i'm ha I'm happy to stay on but like is, is anything any last comments um you know before we, before we kind of wrap up um jack no i'm uh it was it was good man i think uh i was i definitely went on some tangents there so hopefully uh hopefully anyone listening made it to the end here but it was a fun conversation for me at least the um, no definitely and the the tangents are great because really what we're trying to what we're trying to do with this is to get into this sort of context and you know how everything connects together and everything as well so so that's that's beautiful yeah i'm looking forward to uh reading it and let me know when it's out and uh we'll get it we'll get it pushed out i'm sure uh like i yeah i've i've been um listening to some of the Twitter spaces and like trying to sort of catch up with the like the top end of messaging or the people who are supposedly at the forefront of the space. And it's just so incredibly obvious that like everybody has no clue what's going on and they're just trying desperately to add some language to explain it yeah yeah um it, it, and... it basically sorry to interrupt you I, like the 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 transition for me is like going from a space that you know intimately and you can like describe any which way and every podcast interview you get on is just like oh god this again i can't like play a story one more time to this world where like you're a part of like figuring out how to define the thing and that's way more exciting and interesting and uh, you know, gets you out of bed with a bit more uh, vigor. Yeah, um, and, and, I, and I think that's why we kind of wanted to do this as well, was to basically map the space that we're in, because um, it's, it's just moving so quick. Um, and, you know, from my own personal experiences in, to, in, in you know, consulting and talking to companies, it's like, you know, um, back six months ago, there's a lot of platforms trying to become um, an NFT marketplace, um, but now there's there's this thing called you know decentralized exchanges, and there's going to be decentralized exchanges for NFTs. So you know their entire business model has just gone kaput, you know, um, just through like technology technological innovation. So th things like that are um, you know like in hindsight are you know obviously it makes sense that this is, this will happen. But when you're actually doing it, you know as, as you can see, it's like no one knows what they're doing. Even even the people at the very very cutting edge, uh, which is you know mind-blowing yeah i i wonder um i think all of us on this call are probably too young to experience the dot-com bubble but my like my curiosity is how like how insulated can like businesses that are going to be disrupted by crypto how long can they how long can they really go and like the volume of capital that's being chucked around in this space it seems to me like it just seems like a different animal than anything we've seen before and that would lead me to believe that like the transition is going to be fast when it eventually happens yeah um if, yeah I, I think i'm already kind of seeing it because there's like conventional startups that are reaching out to me and they're like hey how do i get onboarded with crypto how do i become a crypto platform which is a hundred percent, it's a crazy pivot. Um, you know, like you, you want to integrate yeah. to something that you don't have any experience with, you know, you don't know how to read solidity or, you know, you don't, you're not familiar with all the different blockchains and what's their intricacies. So I, I think that's happening very slowly, uh, much like how back in the nineties, you know, like certain small businesses were setting up websites and, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. you know, even though they didn't have all the technical infrastructure um, and I think, I was, I was listening to a podcast with Mark Andreessen and he was saying the first bookshop was not Amazon. It was another shop. They didn't even have a computer, but they were close to someone that had a fax machine and then someone else set up a router where they would, you know, basically hard coded, you know, any order that goes into the website will be faxed to them and they'll send it. <laughs> um, 
and they have to like wire payments through different means and stuff so like that's how early we are in terms of like crypto you know it's like crazy <laughs> crazy early you know um yeah so, man we're all luddites yeah all the time yeah. all the time it's, it's really hard to it's really hard to put that in context that that like you're always going to be experiencing the shit version of something it's kind of a weird way to think about it but it's true yeah yeah definitely that's uh that's pretty mind-blowing if but, um, um yeah yeah if you guys both don't mind i do have another question for for jack here that just uh i forgot we glossed over um yeah let's go with regards to um the ux and ui of sort of the decentralized apps and all these like there's there's a real gap there in terms of um you know it, just even buying crypto for the first time or buying an nft if, if you're not used to it all it's it's there's quite a few hurdles compared to every other app in the world which holds your hand through the whole process um is that something you've put a lot of thought into jack in terms of maybe a product or something that you could create yeah you know like i i actually think that the the speed of it is way more compressed um and the like the talent that is getting onboarded into crypto at the speed at which it's getting onboarded i think it's gonna it's gonna resolve itself incredibly quickly have you guys used rainbow the ethereum wallet i wanted to but it's not supported in canada uh it's that's that's like i think that's indicative of like where things are going that feels like a real like consumer friendly app mm -hmm. and um i i like i feel like i'm out of practice to the point where i was doing ui and ux work maybe far ago and now i feel like and that's a whole like mountain to climb to get back into that world mm -hmm. um but I do think, I th I th I think like there's a there's another like contradictory thing about this whole thing is like there's like a suite of four or five products you use as a you know as a um, let's say the NFT space you got Twitter, Discord, OpenSea, and then like MetaMask or Rainbow Wallet, and mm -hmm. these tools are all like pushing out updates to millions of people every day and. I think people sort of, this is another interesting thing. Like I see this happen in web two all the time. It's like, I'm going to build the next Facebook or I'm going to like, you know, make a, I'm going to build a really niche app. And I feel like there's going to be this weird, um, like this weird consolidation that comes with crypto where like the creativity is decentralized and the like opportunity is somewhat decentralized and like unbundled, but these platforms because the liquidity of these markets depends upon like all eyeballs in the same place. Mm -hmm. It feels to me like there's only going to be a few winners winning out and they're going to be able to attract all the quality um, UX, UI, creative, finance, legal talent. So I don't see it as like this massive fractionalized universe of apps and stuff. I see it as like, you know, it's just going to be a few or maybe even they start to integrate. Right. And you just live on this, this, uh, set of a couple of platforms so um yeah, yeah i think it's so gonna happen fast i i mean to touch on that there's um I, i've got a thread somewhere you know from years ago where it says basically um it documents the transition from an innovation or an idea into an infrastructure and what that kind of journey looks like is essentially um you know for instance running water or like the pipe system it was an innovation then it was a technology um, and then it became infrastructure where, you know, it's mm. like a human, it's a human good right now. So I think that's what's happening with crypto, but at a breakneck speed. So, um, and I think um, it's interesting to mention a conversation we had yesterday with um, the guy from ENS, Brantley. Um, I mean, he's more than a guy, you know, he's, he, <laughs> he's been here for a number of years and he's very accomplished. But, um, you know, essentially what he was saying was that he, he wants to become, he wants the uh, ENS to become an infrastructure layer of identity on the internet essentially um so like everyone has a dot eth address um, and that becomes a de facto um you know layer that things are being built on and i and i think that's very paramount in crypto and I, and everyone i talk to i say to them you know that's what that's the kind of like ideal goal that you should aim for it's, instead of a giant SaaS company where you have a huge churn 
but rather an integrative piece of um, you know open source software eventually where everyone can use it and you'll get um, you know you'll get rewarded for that you know through various um, incentive mechanisms uh, so you can create a protocol you can have tokens and you know there's, there's loads of different new things happening all the time and and, and I think you know that that normally that that cycle of from like innovation idea innovation to like um, you know actual infrastructure like the internet for instance is is, is speeding up so you know roads for instance you know they had to be invented even though they were invented like you know from the roman ages but like tarmac for instance a uh, running water the internet now people saying that access to the internet is a human right um you know so is access to a crypto wallet a human right or a bank account um mm-hmm. you know so like all these kind of things are just like massively massively speeding up um so much like how you know within six seven years uh, ethereum has become almost like an infrastructure layer um, of like all these dApps and you know smart contracts um I, I think that's just that i think that's the thing that's being compressed and you know very very sped up yeah man that the like the, i think this is a good like closing conversation the idea that technology is eroding the middle so you have the infrastructure stuff like a barbell right on one side of it it's just like platform infrastructure like these are the standards and then on the very other side you have like every individual as an API or these little networks of individuals that have chosen to collaborate with each other or create something with each other. And in the way, like the amount of wasted effort and energy on web two of like how many people are out there building like a course about how to get Twitter followers. It's just like obscene or like building a productivity (laughs) tool or, you know, let's like, there's these crazy duplicative efforts of stuff that's just, not going to go anywhere that you can i could look take like one second to look at it and be like you're wasting your energy on this you go build or contribute to the building of this massive protocol or turn yourself into this very specific thing where you have the skill that you can contribute to the network uh i think ens is a great example of a uh a friend that works there and he's like yeah it's just the most freaking the most fun and the most rewarding work i've ever done because you're working on something that's like just a profound layer of technology that's going to make this yeah. transition um, easier for a lot of people. I, I, I think that's a big thing that a lot of people see in this space too, um, you know, around just finding some meaning, you know, to connect things back to what we were talking about sort of at the yeah, start of our conversation here, people working jobs that don't really do anything, pushing paper around. You mentioned the insurance industry. That's where I last worked as a salary job. And yeah, like, there's you go home feeling like you did absolutely nothing at the end of the day yeah. right and 100 percent almost more than anything else that's what people are kind of lacking in their lives is like a uh, a sense of community but also like that what they're building matters and it actually helps people so um being that that yeah. connected and that like hands-on really matters i think yeah, and the the idea, the the changing definition of utility to like entertaining people, like you don't need to be Jay Z in order to make a mu- in order to make a living, um, you know, producing art, and you can just be a part of a network that produces art that twenty thousand people enjoy or thirty thousand people enjoy, and live off that. I think that's one of the one of the things that makes me frustrated when i see the critique of it is people almost defending a like a system that does not give them any shot at meaning you know it's really bizarre to see and hard to convince people otherwise um but i think the underlying infrastructure here is way more uh is way more possible for you to find something entertaining and interesting than trying to plug yourself into into a business or something that was invented before this technology was available mm-hmm. yeah um definitely um cool i think i think it's, we're quite over time and um quite vary of people's um various responsibilities but yeah cool um jack it's been a huge pleasure i think that was a very touching note in terms of you know ending there and um, you know, we hope to do this. We hope to have like a running series, so maybe we can have you on for the next one because you know this this conversation has been fascinating to me. Yeah, I love it. Thank you guys for having me. I appreciate it. 
yeah, it's been great to, uh, to, to meet you as well, Jack. Likewise, mate. Um, yeah, keep me posted and uh, we'll chat soon. And I look forward to listening to the other conversations you guys have too. Appreciate it.